I'm continuing with story Tiger Tiger from the Jungle Books. Mowgli has moved back in with the humans. He seems to be learning the language okay, thinks people are kind of ridiculous, but Shere Khan the tiger still wants to kill him, leave his bones in the Wangunga. So Mowgli has Grey Brother and three other wolf brothers from his pack watching for Shere Khan because right now he is taking care of a herd of buffaloes, and that is where we will pick up from. Then Mowgli picked out a shady place and lay down and slept while the buffaloes grazed around him. Herding in India is one of the laziest things in the world. The cattle move and crunch and lie down and move on again, and they do not even low. They only grunt, and the buffaloes very seldom say anything, but get down into the muddy pools one after another and work their way into the mud till only their noses and staring china blue eyes show above the surface, and there they lie like logs. The sun makes the rocks dance in the heat, and the herd children hear one kite, never any more, whistling almost out of sight overhead, and they know that if they died, or a cow died, the kite would sweep down, and the next kite miles away would see him drop and follow, and the next, and the next, and almost before they were dead, there would be a score of hungry kites come out of nowhere. Then they, then they sleep and wake and sleep again, and weave little baskets of dried grass and put grasshoppers in them, or catch two praying mantises and make them fight, or string a necklace of red and black jungle net nuts, or watch a lizard basking on a rock, or a snake hunting a frog near the wallows. Then they sing long, long songs with odd native quavers at the end of them, and the day seems longer than most people's whole lives. And perhaps they make a mud castle with mud figures of men and horses and buffaloes and put reeds into the men's hands and pretend that they are kings and the figures of their armies or that they are gods to be worshipped. Then evening comes and the children call and the buffaloes lumber up out of the sticky mud with their noses like gunshots going off one after the other and they all string across the gray plain back to the twinkling village lights. Day after day Mowgli would lead the buffaloes out to their wallows and day after day he would see Grey Brother's back a mile and a half away across the plain, so he knew that Shere Khan had not come back, and day after day he would lie on the grass listening to the noises round him and dreaming of the old days in the jungle. If Shere Khan had made a false step with his lame paw up in the jungle by the Langunga, Mowgli would have heard him in those long, still mornings. At last the day came when he did not see Grey Brother at the signal place, and he laughed and herded the buffaloes for the ravine by the dahok tree, which was all covered with golden red flowers. There sat Grey Brother, every bristle of his back lifted. He is hidden for a month to throw thee off thy guard. He crossed the ranges last night with Tabakwi, hot foot on thy trail, said the wolf panting. Mowgli frowned. I am not afraid of Shere Khan, but Tabakwi is very cunning. Have no fear, said Grey Brother, licking his lips a little. I met Tabakwi in the dawn. Now he is telling all his wisdom to the kites, but he told me everything before I broke his back. Shere Khan's plan is to wait for thee at the village gate this evening for thee and for no one else. He is lying up now in the big dry ravine of the Wangunga. He is e Has he eaten today or does he hunt empty? said Mowgli, for the answer meant life or death to him. He killed at dawn a pig. He is drunk too. Remember, Shere Khan could never fast, even for the sake of revenge. Oh, fool! Oh, fool! fool, what a cub's cub it is, eaten and drunk too, and he thinks that I shall wait till he has slept? Now, where does he lie up? If there were but ten of us, we might pull him down where as he lies. These buffaloes will not charge unless they wind him, and I cannot speak their language. Can we get behind his track so that they may smell it? He swam far down the Wangunga to cut that off, said Grey Brother. Tabak, we told him that, I know. He would never have thought of it alone. Mowgli stood with his finger in his mouth, thinking, The big ravine of the Wangunga. That opens out on the plain not half a mile from here. I can take the herd round through the jungle to the head of the ravine and then sweep down, but he would slink out on but he would slink out at the foot. We must block that end. Grey brother, canst thou cut the herd in two for me? Not I perhaps, but I have brought a wise helper. And Grey Brother trotted off and dropped into a, a hole. 
Then there lifted up a huge gray head that Mowgli knew well, and the hot air was filled with the most desolate cry of all of the most desolate cry of all the jungle, the hunting howl of a wolf at midday. Akela! Akela! said Mowgli, clapping his hands. I might have known that thou wouldst not forget me. We have ha we have a big work in hand. Cut the herd in two, Akela. Keep the cows and the calves together, and the bulls and the plow buffaloes by themselves. The two wolves ran, ladies' chain fashion, in and out of the herd, which snorted and threw up its head and separated into two clumps. In one, the cow buffaloes stood with their calves in the center and glared and pawed, ready if a wolf would only stay still to charge down and trample the life out of him. In the other, the bulls and the young bulls snorted and stamped, but they too looked more imposing. They were much less dangerous, for they had no calves to protect. No six men could have divided the herd so neatly. What orders? panted Akela. They are trying to join again. Mowgli slipped on Rama's back. Drive the bulls away to the left, Akela. Gray brother, when we are gone, hold the cows together and drive them into the foot of the ravine. How far? said Gray brother, panting and snapping. Till the sides are higher than Shere Khan can jump, shouted Mowgli. Keep them there till we come down. The bulls swept off as Akela bayed and Gray brother stopped in front of the cows. They charged down on him and he ran just before them to the foot of the ravine as Akela drove the bulls far to the left. Well done. Another charge and they are fairly started. Careful now, careful, Akela. A snap too much and the bulls will charge. Hiya! This is wilder work than driving the black buck than driving black buck. Didst thou think these creatures could move so in the jungle? I have. I have hunted these two in my time, gasped Akela in the dust. Shall I turn them into the jungle? I turn, swiftly turn them. Rama is mad with rage. Oh, if I could only tell him what I need of him today. The bulls were turning to the right this time and crashed into the standing thicket. The other herd children, watching with the cattle half a mile away, hurried to the village as fast as their legs could carry them, crying that the buffaloes had gone mad and run away. But Mowgli's plan was simple enough. All he wanted to do was to make a big circle uphill to get at the head of the ravine, and then take the bulls down it and catch Shere Khan between the bulls and the cows, for he knew that after a meal and a full drink, Shere Khan would not be in any condition to fight or to clamber up the sides of the ravine. He was soothing the buffaloes now by voice, and Akela had dropped far to the rear, only whispering once or twice to hurry to, to hurry the rear guard. It was a long, long circle, for they did not wish to get too near the ravine and give Shere Khan warning. At last, Mowgli rounded up the bewildered herd at the head of the ravine on a grassy patch that sloped steadily down to the ravine itself. From that height you could see across the tops of the trees down to the plain below, but what Mowgli looked for was at the sides of the ravine, and he saw with a great deal of satisfaction that they ran nearly straight up and down, while the vines and creepers that hung over them would give no foothold to a tiger who wanted to get out. Let them breathe, Akela, he said, holding up his hand. They have not winded him yet. Let them breathe. I must tell Shere Khan who comes. We have him in a trap. He put his hands to his mouth and shouted down the ravine. It was almost like shouting down a tunnel. The echoes jumped from rock to rock. After a long time, there came back the drawling, sleepy snarl of a full-fed tiger just wakened. Who calls? said Shere Khan, and a splendid peacock fluttered up out of the ravine, screeching, I, Mowgli, cattle thief! It is time to come to the Council Rock. Down, hurry them down, Akela. Down, Rama, down! The herd paused for an instant at the edge of the slope. But Akela gave tongue in the full hunting yell, and they pitched themselves, one after the other, just as streamers shoot rapids, the sand and stones spurting up round them. Once started, there was no chance of stopping, and before they were fairly in the bed of the ravine. Rama winded Shere Khan and bellowed, Ha ha! said Mowgli on his back. Now thou knowest! And the torrent of black horns, foaming muzzles, and staring eyes whirled down the ravine like boulders in, a fl in flood time, the weaker buffaloes being shouldered out to the sides of the ravine where they tore through the creepers. 
They knew what the business was before them, the terrible charge of the buffalo herd, against which no tiger can hope to stand. Shere Khan heard the thunder of their hooves, picked himself up and lumbered down the ravine, looking from side to side for some way of escape, but the walls of the ravine were straight, and he had to keep on heavy with his dinner and his drink, willing to do anything rather than fight. The herd splashed through the pool he had just left, bellowing till the narrow cut rang. Mowgli heard an answering bellow from the foot of the ravine, saw Shere Khan turn, the tiger knew, if the worst came to the worst of it, it was better to meet the bulls than the cows with their calves. And then Rama tripped, stumbled, and went on again over something soft with the bulls at his heels, crashed full into the other herd, while the weaker buffaloes were lifted clean off their feet by the shock of the meeting. That charge carried both herds out into the plain, goring, stamping, and snorting. Mowgli watched his time and slipped off Rama's neck, laying about him right and left with his stick. Quick, Akela, break them up, scatter them, or they will be fighting one another. Drive them away, Akela. Hi, Rama, hi, hi, hi. My children, softly now, it is all over. Akela and Grey Brother ran to and fro, nipping the buffalo's legs. And though the herd wheeled once to charge up the ravine again, Mowgli managed to turn Rama, and the others followed him to the wallows. Shere Khan needed no more trampling. He was dead, and the kites were coming for him already. Brothers, that was a dog's death, said Mowgli, feeling for the knife he always carried in a sheath round his neck, now that he lived with men. But I would never have shown fight. His hide will look very well on the council rock. We must get to work swiftly. A boy trained among men would never have dreamed of skinning a ten-foot tiger alone, but Mowgli knew better than anyone else how an animal's skin is fitted on and how it can be taken off. But it was hard work and Mowgli slashed and tore and grunted for an hour, while the wolves lolled out their tongues, or came forward and tugged as he ordered them. Presently a hand fell on his shoulder, and looking up he saw Boldeo with the tower musket. The children had told the village about the buffalo stampede, and Boldeo went out angrily, only too anxious to correct Mowgli for not taking better care of the herd. The wolves dropped out of sight as soon as they saw the man coming. "'What is this folly?' said Boldeo angrily. "'To think!' But thou can't skin a tiger? Where did the buffaloes kill him? It is the lame tiger, too, and there are a hundred rupees on his head. Well, well, we will overlook thy letting thy herd run off, and perhaps I will give thee one of the rupees of the reward when I have taken the skin. The Kaniwara, he fumbled in his waist cloth for a flint of steel and stooped down to sin Shere Khan's whiskers. Most native hunters skin a tiger's whiskers, to prevent his ghost haunted, haunting them. Hum, said Mowgli, half to himself, and ripped back the skin of a forepaw. So thou wilt take the hide to Kaniwara for, re for the reward, and perhaps give me one rupee? Now it is in my mind that I need the skin for my own use. Heh, <laughs> old man, take away that fire. What talk is this to the chief hunter of the village? Thy luck and thy stupidity and thy buffaloes have helped thee to this kill. The tiger is just fed, or he would have gone twenty miles by this time. Thou canst not even skin him properly, little beggar brat. And forsooth I, Baldeo, must have told him not to singe his whiskers. Must be told not to singe his whiskers. Mowgli, I will not give thee one anna of the reward, but only a very big beating. Leave the carcass. By the bull that brought me, said Mowgli, who was trying to get at the shoulder. Must I stay babbling? To an old ape at noon, here, Akela, this man plagues me. Boldeo, who was still stooping over Shere Khan's head, found himself sprawling on the grass with a gray wolf standing over him, while Mowgli went on skinning as though he were alone in all of India. Yes, he said between his teeth, thou art altogether right, Boldeo. Thou wilt never give me one honor of the reward. There is an old war between this lame tiger and myself, a very old war, and I have won. And we will pause there.